Let's delve even deeper into the Nintendo library with a look at cartridges for the NES that weren't actually games. And by that I mean pretty much anything compatible with the Nintendo Entertainment System, where the point of engaging with it isn't competitive and that doesn't necessarily have a definite end like points or levels or lives. Way before Mario Paint, there were a handful of attempts at all kinds of drawing, music, exercise, and even tarot reading cartridges that were sold in stores to be played on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Some of these are pretty rare, or they utilize a very specific accessory that I may or may not have. So while I usually try and highlight the physical objects related to the NES on this channel, I may have to gloss over a few of these for my wallet's sake. With that in mind, let's jump in. Here's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, Videomation, which went so far as to put this advisory label on the front. Not a game, a drawing and animation system. I mean, I'm thankful for the heads up, but this tiger exploding ferociously out of the TV tells me that maybe they put this warning on here so they wouldn't get sued for misleading consumers. Videomation is a very primitive drawing program. You can make lines in various ways, either freeform or by connecting the dots or following the snake, or spread out preset shapes like rectangles or ovals. I'm not really sure how to regulate the size though, as my recs are pretty modest, but my ovals are so massive that the game struggles to load them. Slow down, Videomation! You're stroking out! And if geometric shapes aren't your thing, you can also place these random collection of stickers wherever you want, including these irradiated children straight out of Omega Man. Yowzers. You have 10 colors to choose from, but then you can cycle between 13 other sets, some of which pulsate awkwardly. Whoa. You cannot mix and match though. Once you pick a 10 color palette and start drawing, if you change to a new set, all the previous work will change accordingly. Obviously, drawing is not amazing without a mouse, but worse than that is there's no undo, meaning that if you make a mistake, you either need to erase it or start over. Wah wah. The animation component also is not exactly what you'd think it'd be. All those stickers can be directed to move in four ways, but you can't really place them on the screen, use more than one at a time, or even do anything with them once you test it. So you're basically drawing a scene as best you can and then trying to set up a character to do a basic maneuver, like how I had this cool cat cruise by my wall. That scribble of graffiti says James, by the way. Nailed it. Sticking with the animation, here's a far more interesting title, Tiny Toons Cartoon Workshop. The NES saw three Tiny Toons games, Tiny Toons Adventures, which plays like a solid Mario 3 knockoff, Tiny Toons 2 Trouble in Wacky Land, which is more of a mini-games compilation, and finally the animation studio we're discussing today. Here you're given a ton of options including various stages, multiple characters each of whom has varying animations to choose from, a second character for them to interact with, props, word balloons, and even sound effects. More than that, you can actually manipulate the scene frame by frame so that what you're seeing on screen changes as the seconds progress. It is way, way more complex and versatile than Videomation, and while maybe not as much of a learning curve as using After Effects or something, I've been messing with it for an hour and I still don't quite grasp everything at my disposal. So far I've only been able to make a few short, disjointed episodes that leave a bit to be desired. But check out the demo for the opening, which gives a full example of what's possible. Yes, this entire sequence was made using this cartridge. That's amazing. I probably won't spend the requisite amount of time needed to produce something even close to that quality, but as a kid who was very interested in this medium, I absolutely would have dedicated many hours to making the most ridiculous cartoons I could come up with. Moving on to a game whose title hides no secrets, it's Color a Dinosaur. And yes, get ready to do exactly that. Hey, I think I recognize some of these names from the Videomation credits, and yeah, Color a Dinosaur is somewhat similar to that game, but even more dumbed down. You don't have any drawing options, at all. No pencil or shape tools, just the classic paint bucket, which fills in an area that you can scroll between with the D-pad. B picks the color, A drops it in the space, select lets you scroll between the palettes, start ends the session, and goes back to the dinosaur choices. It cannot get much simpler than this. Like, I showed this to my three-year-old and even she got bored almost immediately. I cannot imagine paying $60 retail for this in 1993. But what I can't imagine is paying much, much more for that many years later, as Color Dinosaur is now one of the rarest cartridges released for the system. Yay. 
I can't speak for all the collectors out there, but when I first really got into my NES accumulation, it started off out of pure nostalgia, moved on to hidden gems and recommended titles, filled in with some oddballs and deep cuts, and then one day, I reached the point of no return, which for me was this, the day I willingly paid money for Color Dinosaur, just so I could shove it onto my shelf and check it off the list. I knew then that this was no longer about having cool games to play with my buddies, and it crossed the line well over into obsessive collecting. What a hobby! Taboo the Sixth Sense is easily the strangest game I've ever seen. Despite its ominous name, it is oddly enough a tarot reading simulator that's supposed to be some sort of fun party game you'd play with friends. Sounds doubtful. Basically, you enter your name, sex, and birth date, followed by a question you want answered by the universe. Then there's an intense card shuffling scene that is... Jesus. And then finally the reading. The cards are drawn and each is accompanied by an explanation that should in theory relate to your question. I mean, you can read into any of this as much as you want, but I ran the exact same information twice in a row and got completely opposite assessments. One ending in ruin and one where, hey, things are looking up. And man, I pulled a lot of tarot, but I still can't find the Lamentation of the Women card in here. After you've learned all there is to know, the game offers you some lottery numbers. Okay. What's funny for me is that they have the different states and even Canadian provinces, but not all of them. And as such, I cannot get the lucky numbers for my home state of Georgia. <laughs> what? I always balked at this, like how dare they exclude my beloved if incredibly flawed state, but I just now realize it's because we didn't get a lottery until 1992, four years after this game came out in stores. Okay then. Taboo is kind of an interesting idea, and it's got some especially rad music from Rare's David Wise, but I've actually tried playing this at a party, and after two attempts, trust me, whatever makes this game so taboo wears off quick. Also, it's pretty clear that whoever's in charge of playing and censoring NES games did not last long with old Taboo, as there are some surprisingly explicit visuals that show up as soon as the menu screen. Hubba hubba. The title we're gonna need a little assistance with is Dance Aerobics. I have never actually played this game, ever. It just sits on my shelf collecting dust. Why? Well, because it's an exercise simulator that utilizes the power pad. Yep. Since this is my first time ever playing a power pad title on this channel, let's talk about it for a second. The power pad came packaged with the NES and the game World Class Track Meet, but also the sick combo that is the Mario Duck Hunt World Class Track Meet card. It works just like a Dance Dance Revolution interface, where moving your feet or hand to different spots on the mat corresponds to actions on the screen. There were only seven games that made it onto the Nintendo Entertainment System, four track and field titles, two fascinating weirdos in Short Order Explode and Street Cop, and today's ungame qualifier, Dance Aerobics. You flip the power pad to side B, which has 12 buttons, stand on the pad where the instructor is, and then follow her movements. In theory, at least. The power pad seemed huge when I was a kid, but now seems comically small. My 6'3", 200 pound body can barely stay on it, let alone keep from pressing multiple buttons at once. God, I am going to regret sharing this with the internet. The introductory steps are pretty simple, but man, I was surprised how tired my arms got after just 30 seconds of this. What a wimp. There's a couple other modes like this point-based routine thing that confused me and this single-player version of Twister, which is actually pretty fun. Whew, can't wait till I have to interview for a job and someone finds this in a Google search. At its heart, Dance Aerobics is absolutely just a series of exercise routines, but now that I've spent more time with it, I have to admit that these are kind of games. Sorta. Like if you make too many mistakes or don't nail enough moves, you won't be able to complete the lesson. Oh no, not the lesson. Guess I'll have to go back to drinking beer in front of my computer. I will say though, if you wanted to do aerobics, there are way worse methods than utilizing the power pad and this oddball of a cartridge. Also, this track right here is a real jammer. Here's another title I have never played, the Miracle Piano Teaching System. This is an instructional tool that's used along with the Miracle Piano, a full-size keyboard that can plug into the Nintendo controller port. I actually do not have the Miracle Piano, and as far as I can tell, there is absolutely no way to engage with the Miracle cartridge without using the piano accessory. 
So all I can do when I turn it on is gaze at the title screen and watch a couple demos, which oddly enough have no piano sounds, just the cold, steady rhythm of the metronome chugging along. Damn, this is depressing. Purely for the sake of this video, I'd love to have the keyboard just to show y'all how it works. And believe me, I've debated buying this thing for years now. But I already have tons of Nintendo junk laying around that I never use, like the U-Force, the Power Glove, and the amazing Konami Laser Scope. So yeah, I don't think I have enough space or money to justify never playing this thing. So for now, I'd say watch this 12-year-old video from Gamester81, where he gives an in-depth overview of the miracle, and then let's never speak of it again. And here's one that's absolutely cheating, the world-class service test cartridge. These were never sold in stores, but were instead used with these test stations that retailers employed in order to run diagnostic checks on your NES and its various accessories. Mine is for the control deck, i.e. the console, but there's one specific to the power pad and the joystick, whatever that is. If you pop this into your Nintendo, you're given a series of prompts, some of which are just the cartridge checking the internals, and some of which are you making sure the controller is interfacing with the console. It's a real thrill ride for sure. Turns out there's not a lot of these out there, and while they are sought after by the deepest of super collectors, they don't command the same interest as actual rare games like stadium events or bubble bath babes. Still an interesting side note of the NES, and man, it is hard to beat this rad orange color and this sexy drawing of Mario giving it to the Nintendo cartridge. I don't usually delve too deep into the Japanese NES, the Famicom, but they had way more weirdo non-game games released over there, so it's worth looking into. Unfortunately, I do not own any of these, so all I can do is give a brief rundown, and we're gonna have to use our imaginations a little bit. The Family Basic is a cartridge keyboard combo that allows you to turn your Famicom into a simple home computer. You can use the basic computer language to program games, music, and presumably some other stuff. Sorry, I'm completely out of my league here. The cartridge itself lacked the space to save any of these creations internally, even though it has a AA battery slot. So Nintendo also sold the Data Recorder, which could save your stuff to a cassette tape. That's amazing. The Family Basic was apparently pretty popular in Japan, so much that it received two additional updates. Without the keyboard, I can only watch this computer descramble itself while shouting out pure bleak bloop mania. Sorry, wish I could show more, but there's a great video I'll link to where Masahiro Sakurai of Smash Bros fame gives a nostalgic overview of the Family Basic, which he says led him into game programming, so yeah, that rules. Definitely check that out. Karaoke Studio is, surprise, karaoke setup for the Famicom. So naturally there's a microphone to sing into, but more than that, it actually recognizes your singing in-game and can register how accurate your performance is. That's honestly pretty impressive. What's also interesting is that instead of using a cartridge, it's actually a whole unit that plugs into the Famicom, and then there were additional mini carts that plugged into that. Neat. There were three volumes of karaoke track cartridges released to play on the studio, and I browsed through the first one a bit, even though without the microphone accessory, these are completely unplayable. There's four modes to choose from, one that's just a free play to sing all the tracks, two differing styles of competitions, where you're either singing in front of an audience or in front of three idol style panelists, and the fourth option, which just kind of strobes awkwardly and plays a few notes of different tracks. No idea. While all the text is in Japanese, I was surprised to hear a few tracks I recognized, like Jingle Bells of all things. And man, this track that accompanies the Power Rangers is jamming. I gotta learn this one, stat. The final Japanese exclusive oddity is something I absolutely thought was a joke the first time I heard of it. I am a teacher, Super Mario No Sweater. Yes, this is a title where all you do is look at sweater designs. I'm speechless! Basically, you can choose one of 15 styles, input your measurements, and then take a look at the various cuts and views of your soon-to-be sweater. Having never knitted a sweater myself, the information is entirely lost on me, but presumably, if you followed these instructions, you too could have a garment as magnificent as the one shown on the cover. At first I thought all these were just single color blanks, but over time I found some animal shapes, and eventually some of the simple but rad Mario themed buddies. 
As this is the most absurd idea for a Nintendo cartridge I can imagine, I actually have sought this out, only to learn that it's one of the absolute rarest Famicom Disk System games ever sold, and the only eBay listings I could find had it either at $450 or $10,000, so somewhere in between maybe? Totally worth it. Finally, let's talk about the modern era and some of the albums that have been released on cartridges in recent years. Yes, albums. There is already a subgenre of electronic music called chiptune that utilized the hardware of old consoles to make new compositions, but some ambitious wizards took it even further by placing their tracks on actual NES games. That's amazing. There are a whole mess of these out there to explore, like tons, but here's one I dug that I'll give a brief sample of, Vox 2. To me, these are such a rad, innovative way to utilize the original hardware and create a unique experience for the listener that really can't be done through audio streaming. So cool. Not much else to say, but man, that's awesome. And that's it. I'm sure there's more oddities out there somewhere that I missed, and the homebrew scene remains full of surprises, so who knows, there's probably more cartridges with non-games being released as we speak. As always, if y'all can think of some others that are worth discussing, leave them in the comments, and if there's enough, maybe I'll come back to this at some point for a part two. Just thought it was kind of an odd occurrence, especially back in the day, and a lot of these cards I'd never even taken off the shelf, let alone put within 10 feet of my Nintendo, so it's kind of fun just to mess around with them. Big shout out to the folks on my Discord for helping me out with this topic. Y'all are awesome. Speaking of shout outs, as some of you may know, I took kind of a break recently as my wife and I had a baby in October, so I've got a lot of thanks stored up that I'm going to throw out here. Props to my buddy Elucidus, who moderates my stream, and who was kind enough to send me these retro-themed onesies. Man, so cool. And speaking of the streams, the last one I did before we went to the hospital ended with a bunch of y'all generously donating in an impromptu baby shower. I still think about that all the time. It was such a sweet, unexpected gesture. Y'all are amazing. And finally, an especially massive shout out to my newest Patreon subscriber, Double O Clint, for whom I've drawn this zapper sign. I was gonna go full James Bond, but this was where my mind went. Thanks man, welcome to the club, and especially for being so patient. If you want to join Double O Clint in the champagne room, head on over to patreon.com slash words and consider becoming a member. It means a lot. Until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>